worship service for Clarendon United Methodist Church. We're so happy you joined us today. The order of worship can be found on our website, www.clarendonumc.org worship. There, you will also find a way to give your offerings and tithes online, www.clarendonumc.org give. Now, let us prepare our minds and hearts together in worship. Welcome, friends in Christ, as we gather for worship. This week, we're starting a new worship series called The Bible Tells Me So. Together, we'll be exploring the biblical roots of our work for social justice in the world, as well as seeing what we can learn from our Wesleyan heritage as United Methodists. How does our faith inform us as we seek to live out our prayer that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven? So come, friends, let's join in worship of the God of wisdom, justice, and love. We have gathered in God's holy presence, the one who etches grace in, on our hearts. This is the place where God will transform us into disciples. We glorify God who yearns for justice, not just a favored few, but for the least of our world. This is a, the place where God will write compassion on our souls. We give thanks to God for unceasing grace. We remember God's persistence in saving us. This is, a, is the place where God will breathe the word into our lives. Let us respond in faith. Let us pray for the courage to do justice. O oh Lord, open my eyes that I may see the needs of others. Open my ears that I may hear their cries. Open my heart so that they need not be without succor. Let me not be afraid to defend the weak because of the anger of the strong nor afraid to defend the poor because of the anger of the rich. Show me where love and hope and faith are needed. And use me, use me to bring them to those places. And so open my eyes and my ears that I may this coming day be able to do some work of peace for thee. Amen. A reading from the prophet Micah chapter 6. Hear what the Lord says. 
Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? In what have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt, and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses and Aaron and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam, son of Breor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I am privileged and proud to be the pastor of Clarendon United Methodist Church. What a wonderful church family this is. Of course, we have a beautiful place of worship that means the world to us. And be sure to stop by and see the incredible, magnificent flower garden in all of its glory. It's in full bloom this week, and I tried to give you a taste of it at the beginning of our service today. But we also have a heritage of more than a century of service here in the community. Our work with AFAC for close to 30 years is right at the heart of that. But really, it's the people that make this church so special. Together, this church family is ready to learn and grow, to turn to the scriptures and learn what Jesus would teach us about what it is to be the church. We yearn to see with God's vision and to live into that vision in our own lives and in our shared life together. And that has prepared us well for this amazing season in our life together. The world has been going through turbulent times. We've been dealing with a global health crisis and all of the challenges and changes that have gone along with it. This pandemic has taken a lot out of us. And it's also taught us a lot about ourselves. And we hope and pray that we are beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel. But all across our country, this last year has also brought us face to face with some important social issues that have demanded our serious attention, injustices that are woven into the fabric of our culture have come into sharp focus. Once more, our country's long history of exclusion, oppression, and violence toward people of color has been exposed and called out. We continue to see the unacceptable disparities in opportunity for people of color in education, housing, health, and employment, and in restricted access to security and justice. The sin of racism is still at work in our world every day. But at Clarendon United Methodist Church, we're committed to the fight against systemic racial injustice. And that's not the only issue that we've faced in these challenging times. Last year, we also chose to move forward to become a reconciling congregation, a church that is committed to working toward full inclusion of people of all sexual orientations and gender identities in both the policies and the practices of the United Methodist Church and of our own congregation. Together in the church, we yearn for a world that reflects God's will for just treatment and full inclusion of all persons. Our congregation hasn't run from these challenging issues, choosing instead 
to ask ourselves hard questions, to open our hearts, to expand our understanding through reading, prayer, panel discussions, dialogues, and other means. We've chosen to take steps to address systemic injustices that we see in the world around us and to hold ourselves accountable to make positive changes in our own lives. My goodness, the work is certainly not over. Indeed, we could say it's only just begun. And sometimes our steps are faltering as we learn together and we learn how much we still have to learn. But this work has been an important part of our journey through these turbulent times. And that means a lot to me. I hope it does to you. It's important to understand why we choose to engage with these and other vital social issues. As United Methodist Christians, we turn to the Bible and to our Wesleyan heritage to help us to navigate as God's people in today's world. So today, and for the next few weeks, we'll be exploring biblical teachings and the witness of our Methodist heritage, our Methodist siblings throughout the years, to learn about the roots of our work for social justice in the world. In the United Methodist Church, one of our baptismal vows asks this of us. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? What a powerful question this is, and what a difficult vow to make. Because resisting evil, injustice, and oppression is usually hard work. It tends to be controversial, too. People disagree about what evil looks like, what counts as injustice, who is really being oppressed. And many people have a lot to lose if the way our culture currently operates is challenged or changed. But the resistance of evil is rooted in scripture. Resisting evil is part of who we are as Christians. In Romans chapter 12, we're taught to love unambiguously, hating the evil, holding fast to the truth. And Amos chapter 5 says, hate evil, love good, maintain justice in the courts. That's a paraphrase. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's go back to the starting point. From the very beginning of the biblical narrative in the book of Genesis, we see God's perspective on humankind. Humans are created in God's image, created out of God's love and desire for relationship. And scripture tells us God saw this creation and it was good even though we have distorted that image by turning away from God in oh so many ways, God still has an everlasting love for us. So anything and everything that degrades or demeans any person or group of people is contrary to God's will and way. Throughout the Old Testament, God is attentive to the cries of those in need, the hungry, the oppressed, the widow, the orphan. And the people of God are not called into a life of privilege, but instead called into a special responsibility to be attentive as God is to the cries, the hurts, the pains of those around us. In the book of Exodus, God declares, you shall not wrong or oppress a resident alien for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. You shall not abuse any widow or orphan. If you do abuse them when they cry out to me, I will surely heed their cry. My wrath will burn. God cares, and the Bible tells us all about it. By the 8th century, before the time of Jesus, prophets like Amos, Hosea, and Micah come onto the scene with powerful passion. They called the people of God to examine their own lives and their shared life together to see how their behavior was, let's just say, troubling to God and how they had turned from God's ways. 
Our scripture passage today comes from Micah, chapter 6. Micah was a country prophet who spoke to people, his people, at the time of the fall of the northern kingdom at the hands of the Assyrians. It was a time of great turbulence for them in their own culture. Micah gives his people a warning, but also a vision of the kind of future they could embrace if they chose to. They could live like everyone else in the lands all around them, lured by the gods of money and power, or they could choose to become agents of God's justice and peace for all people. Earlier in the book, he spelled out some of the many misdeeds that he's seen in the political corruption of his day. He's seen the nation spiraling toward catastrophe. The rich landowners defraud the weak and the vulnerable. Political leaders think they can get away with anything without being stopped. And no one seems to be taking up the cause of justice. I love how today's text begins. God is bringing God's people to court. And who will be the jury in the trial? Let's listen for what God says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people. He will contend with Israel. The mountains themselves are going to hear God's dispute with the people. And in this grand courtroom drama, God's opening statement is blunt. I have been endlessly faithful and you have been relentlessly fickle. The people have not matched God's constancy and love. Micah asks a crucial question in the midst of the injustice and violence in his Judean society. What does God expect of you? This is a key question for the people of Israel who must come before God when their relationship with God has been broken. And the answer we hear in this courtroom is clear. We are expected to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. Not to give sacrifices, not to play out any ritual actions, but to live out God's will and way with our lives. Another way to say it is that we're called to show mercy, to embrace faith, and to work for justice to be realized in the world. That's what God expects from us. God makes it clear in the biblical witness. It reminds me of another text from another prophet, Amos. In chapter 5, we hear these words, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. I love to read that text out of the message, a modern paraphrase of the Bible. It goes like this. Do you know what I want? I want justice, oceans of it. I want fairness, rivers of it. That's what I want. Somehow I think this paraphrase really captures God's attitude when it comes to justice. One could complain that the prophets run the risk of becoming too political. That certainly seems to be a common concern about the church in today's world. If it gets involved in advocating for equity and justice for those who are ill-treated in our society, people start saying, oh, the church is becoming too political. So we might ask, should the church be involved in politics? The United Methodist Church is clear on this in acknowledging that we are responsible to God for our social, economic, and political life. The church regards political participation as the privilege and responsibility of citizens, not advocating for particular candidates or telling people how to vote, but definitely taking a stand for justice and equity in the world. Here's what the United Methodist Church says in its social principles. Scripture recognizes that faithfulness to God requires political engagement by the people of God. 
The strength of a political system depends upon the full and willing participation of its citizens. The church should continually exert a strong ethical influence upon the state, supporting policies and programs deemed to be just and opposing policies and pro pro programs that are unjust. Methodists have been actively involved in social and political matters from the time of their very founding in 18th century England. We have always been involved. We were among the primary advocates for the abolition of slavery all across the British Empire, for the organization of labor unions to protect workers from dangerous working conditions, for the ending of the debtor's prison system, for the creation of new systems of care for poor children. With a heritage like that, Methodists have continued to advocate for other social or political uh, issues ever since, issues like women's suffrage, civil rights, health care, and care for the environment. We are still so active in all of these areas. Today, our United Methodist social creed and social principles express our commitment to fully participate in building a more peaceful and just world. We'll talk more about these in the coming weeks. Next week, we'll also explore what Jesus and the New Testament have to say about working for justice in the world. But for now, I invite you to take just one step forward on this journey as we begin to journey together, exploring God's call to the work of justice in the world and in our lives. Maybe, maybe you might turn to our website, for example, to check out the wonderful list of resources that we have that can help you to think about what racial justice might look like in today's world. There are books and articles to read on our website, videos and movies and podcasts you can watch or listen to, even a great guided tour put together by folks from the church, uh, a walking tour here in Arlington in the Halls Hill neighborhood. It's a wonderful experience then maybe look into one of the resources or use one of the links to what the United Methodist Church has to say, what the church is doing to be involved in the dismantling of racial injustice, in our, or dismantling of racism in our world. Or you could learn more about the work of the Reconciling Ministries Network, as together we work to build a more inclusive church. Just take one step this week. Learn one new thing as we start our journey together. God is calling us, just as people throughout the ages have been called, to live into God's great expectation that we will do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with our God. By God's grace, may it ever be so. Hello, um, I'm Pam Jabeer and um, I have a story to tell about implicit bias. Um, I grew up in a fairly liberal home. Uh, my parents were socially very conscious and they tried to teach us, you know, the whole idea of um, equality among persons, although I went to racially segregated schools my entire school experience all the way through college. And, but I always thought of myself as uh, open-minded and not, not having biases against others. I had an experience. Um, many of you know Tyra Simathong, who is a member of our church. She was a young person, grew up in the youth group and the music program here. And Tyra's mom was in my Sunday school class when she was a young kid in elementary school junior high and over at Arlington Forest and she was among many of uh, many Laotian immigrants children who attended that church and we adopted Vani and her brother as our church part of being their church family 
we'd spend our, our Christmases and times together, uh, Christian holidays, we'd have them over. And so they've been part of our family, Bonnie especially. And so when Tyra was born, I met Tyra the day she was born. And she's been part of our family ever since. And uh, once in a while when she was young, she would come and spend the weekend with us. And like I did with our own children, and with some of the neighborhood children around here that we adopted, one of my uh, favorite things to do would be to read books out loud to the kids. One of the young girls here, I read her the entire Harry Potter series out loud. But this one weekend, Tyra was visiting us, and I was recalling that one of my very, very favorite books when I was a child, and I read it several times, was The Secret Garden. And so I thought, I'll just go to the library and check it out, and that's one of the things we'll do over the weekend while Tyra's visiting. And so I got the book out, and she laid down on the couch, and we got ready to read the book, and I began. And it dawned on me as I'm reading this book out loud to a child who is half African American that the language referring to the dark skinned workers in this home was so racist. And I thought, well, I can skip over some of them or I can use different words or I can just skip whole paragraphs while I'm reading this aloud but I, it became apparent that this was going to be language that was used throughout the book and so I just shut the book and I said you know Tyra this book is boring let's pick another one she does not remember the incident. She, she remembers the book being boring and that's all she can remember. But the thing, the reason I wanted to mention this is and share it with you is because I read that book many times as a young person. Never did I think about the language that was being used to describe these dark-skinned help. And it made me think, if I didn't, it, it wasn't conscious to me, which means down deep inside me, I didn't think it was wrong. And that one is one of the things I think implicit bias is, that we are not conscious of some of the things that we have learned through our lifetime. And we really need to work hard to examine those things so that what we say and what we think is not hurtful to others. And this particularly came home to me because of how much I love Tyra. I wouldn't hurt her for the world. And, and she knows that. But still, I would the thought of reading some material that could make her think less of herself was very painful. And so I just thought I should share that with you. I'm the chairperson of the Racial and Social Justice Committee, and that was a new revelation to me. Generous God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, you have shown us what it means to love, and you call us to follow your example, to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Continue to write your law of love on our hearts. Give us an unwavering passion for justice, a boundless spirit of generosity, and a tenacious faith that will not rest until those who are hungry are fed and those who are oppressed find relief and those who are outsiders find a welcome. Amen.
join together in prayer. O God, who has created your children to be free, we celebrate that you are our God and we are your people. From our earliest days, you have called us forth from self-seeking bondage, comfort, complacency, and complaint, to freeing and redeeming action for justice everywhere in the world. O God of Exodus and the burning bush, of the prophets and of Jesus Christ, we hear your powerful calling to be your servants in the service of all those who are oppressed. At every turn, we hear your voice in the cries of the poor, the hungry, the imprisoned, and the broken. For you have made yourself one with those who seek justice, freedom, and peace. We share a vision a promise, and a yearning for the day of your reign. O God, our sustainer, search our hearts and reveal to us our sinfulness, all the ways that we contribute to injustice and are silent in the face of oppression. Give us deep courage to find the true path of your way, ready to give our very selves as living sacrifices to your will. We have heard your calling. Hear us now as we commit ourselves to respond. You are our God, and we are your people. We pledge ourselves now to pursue relentlessly that living, breathing justice which transforms people and peoples. We recommit ourselves to your will for justice and pledge ourselves, our resources, and our actions. Through Christ we pray. Amen.
mercy and seeds of justice grow in the kingdom of God. Bring forth the kingdom of mercy, bring forth the kingdom of peace, bring forth the kingdom of justice, bring forth the city of God. We are a blessed and a Go now to embrace the values of God's reign, values of justice, love, and truth. Go now with God's blessing to live those values through the grace of our challenging, faithful, loving, and empowering God. Amen.